Well, blessings, dear friends. Turn with me, please, if you will, to the book of Isaiah once again, Isaiah chapter 5. Sorry, first of all, one verse in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. Isaiah 2, 2. Now it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief mountain and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. That is obviously a prophecy of the second coming of Christ and the inauguration of the millennial kingdom. I preface what we're going to do now by citing that verse in order to frame this subject and context properly. Remember the last days of Judah. Before <clears throat> Judah went to the Babylonian captivity is a type, a shadow, of what happens before Babylon the Great. You understand? The apostate church will go to Babylon the Great the way apostate Judah went to Babylon. One is the shadow of the other. With this background in view, look with me first of all, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, a familiar passage we often point to in this regard. Verse 6, these things happened as examples for us. What happened to Israel happened as an example to the church. Verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction. Now, not only does it say they were written for our instruction, <clears throat> but upon whom the ends of the ages have come. In other words, the history of Old Testament Israel was written for our instruction. But the specific emphasis is on the last days. Do you see that? Specifically, what Israel's history teaches about the last days, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Okay? Now, of course, broadly speaking, we're in the last days since Pentecost. But as we come to the close of the age, okay, so right there we're told that nearly 70% of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, the Old Testament, was written for our instruction. That's what it says. 70, the Old Testament was written for the instruction of the church. Not to the negation or the replacement for what it means for the Jews but to the incorporation of the church. Look with me, please, to Hebrews, I'm sorry, Romans 15. Verse four, whatever was written in earlier times, that is the Hebrew scripture, was written for our instruction. <clears throat> so we're told this in Romans, we are told this in Corinthians, it's reiterated. It was written. How is it then that there are churches that ignore the Old Testament? <laughs> they will read the Psalms liturgically, maybe, or they will have Sunday school lessons for little children of David and Goliath and Jonah and the whale. But that's it. That's all they do with the Old Testament. It's Sunday school stories for little kids, which is fine. I have mean, no problem with it. I agree with it. And it's liturgical reading of Psalms. That's all. They think we are New Testament Christians. We just read the New Testament. We don't need the old is fulfilled in Christ. Watch. 70% of the scriptures were written for our instruction, says Paul. He says it in Romans, 
It says it in 1 Corinthians. You're missing seven out of ten things God has to say if you don't read the Old Testament. The only Bible the first Christians had was the Old Testament. It's the only one. Now there are other verses that tell us more about this subject. Romans 11 being one of them. Let's look at it. Verse 21, if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. If Israel and the Jews could not escape God's judgment for certain things, how can so-called Christian nations? If he didn't spare the natural branches, if he didn't spare Israel and the Jews, why is he going to spare predominantly Gentile nations with predominantly Gentile churches. These things are too often either ignored completely or downplayed. When in fact, in New Testament theology, they are fundamental. They are fundamental. We could say more about this from Hebrews, but let's not go there now. With this background in view, this was written for our instruction if the, Israel didn't get away with this, either will the, the, the church, the Christians. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 5. Yeshayahu Hanavi Perikei. Verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who call evil good and they call good evil. When someone calls evil good, they're going to call that which is good evil. And when someone calls that which is good evil, they're going to call evil good. It's commutative, it works both ways. In the United States, a statistical majority of women, a statistical majority of women now, of all ages, oppose non-therapeutic abortion. They oppose abortus provocatus, where there's no clinical or medical reason most more women are against it than are for it. Yet, its proponents say it's women's rights, and you are anti-women, and they set themselves up for the spokesman of all women, when in fact, the majority of women do not agree with them. It is completely contradictory to the God-given natural maternal instincts of a human female to kill her baby. Just look at when a young mother, a young wife, is pregnant for the first time. Not only are there hormonological changes <laughs> and anatomical changes, there's changes in temperament, emotion, in the worldview. Somebody can get married and there's still a kid basically in their mind, in their outlook, but once that first kid comes along, they grow up real fast. <laughs> it's like the Israeli soldiers out of high school. A couple of months later, they're in combat. They grow up real fast. They grow up real fast. Well, it's completely alien to nature. Even human age, not talk, talk about believers, it's alien to nature to want to kill your baby. They tried to make laws in the states where the same people talking about women's rights do not want women who are contemplating abortion to see ultrasound images. This is what you're aborting. <laughs> 
just want you to kill the kid because if you saw what's inside of you metabolizing, you might not want to do it. Yet they say women's rights, but they will deny the same woman the right to make a medically informed decision about what she's contemplating. It's unbelievable. They call such evil good. Now you've got people talking about postpartum abortion. That if a fetus survives the abortion procedure. Postpartum, you terminate it. Make it as comfortable as possible and let it die. A pediatric neurologist who's the governor of Virginia is pioneering this. Medically, he knows what he's doing. How will people like that not go to hell? How will people like that not go to hell? They call evil good, good evil. Homosexuality, they call it good. People who oppose it are called evil. They have so many letters I can't remember them all. LGBT, looks like an alphabet soup. Transgender, transgender. The suicide rate among transgender people is 40%. The suicide rate of the general population, depending on the country, is between two and three percent. That's still too high, but it's two or three percent. Among these people, 40 percent. 40 percent, four out of 10, two out of five will kill themselves. The others have a very high statistical predisposition to all sorts of clinical depression and other things. That is called good. How can you call something that does that to people good? If it's good, how come they don't think it's so good after they do it? And the media applauds it. Medical science goes along with it knowing what the suicide rate is. Now you understand 30, 40 years ago, the Royal Society of Psychiatric Medicine, or the American Society of Psychiatric Medicine, they'd be standing up and yelling, this, this is bad. We're here to save patients' lives. This is bad. Now they call evil good. Who's evil? Those who oppose it. <laughs> it's those who oppose evil who are evil. You're against this stuff? You're the evil one. It's the BBC. That's the mentality. I don't bother anymore because it's not worth it, but I used to make complaints to the British Broad's Casting Standards Council over things like blasphemy and certain sexual things I found improper. I don't watch TV anymore. I don't have one. But, well, I have internet, but I don't have to. Anyway, I made complaints. I found out that the people at the Broadcasting Standards Council, most of those are homosexuals. <laughs> They call evil good, and they call good evil. Now it works the other way. What about those who call good evil? He made them male and female and said it was good. First Timothy, they will be teaching doctrines of demons forbidding marriage. 
You outlaw marriage for your clergy? You wind up with a pedophile clergy. And bishops and the Vatican protecting these pedophiles at the expense of not protecting their children because they call something good evil. Not on the basis of scripture, but on the basis of Mankian theology and uh, the philo Man Man Mankian philosophy and Greek dualism that got into the church with the church fathers. Where anything physical was bad or of a lower God, anything uh, ethereal was good. Don't forget for over a thousand years the teaching of the Catholic Church up to the Reformation. This was their teaching. To serve God, you had to be in the clergy. The rest were breeding stock. They were the lesser. The only good thing, this is what they said about marriage is having children who will be celibate. The real servants of God are monks and nuns and things like that and priests. The lesser people are the breeding stock. They're just the studs that you need to populate convents and monasteries. This is what they believed. This is what they taught people. This is what they taught people. You go like to, to, to rural Italy and Ireland and Poland in these countries, it was a big deal to have a priest or nun in the family. That meant you're good breeding stock. <laughs> you're a good stud. This is what they thought. When you call something good evil, you're going to call evil good. Oh, the Catholic Church is good. The Pope is good. No, he isn't. They booed him in South America for protecting pedophiles, his own people. No, he isn't. Jesus said it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea than hurt a little kid. Now, there's a spiritual meaning to that, but not to the negation of what it literally means. It's not good, it's evil. You know, in the States, the Italian Mafia, and in Europe, the Russian Mafia, draw a line with pedophilia. If a member of the American Italian mob was caught in child prostitution or child pornography, they would get whacked. The Mafia would kill them. The Catholic Church protects them. Mafia Don would have them knocked off. They'd find them floating in the East River with a pair of lead boots. Over here, they just transfer them. The Mafia wouldn't protect the pedophile. It takes the Roman Catholic Church to go that low. But they call it good. Once you call something good evil, you're going to call something evil good. Once you call something evil good, you're going to call that which is good evil. This is what Isaiah was up against as he was trying to warn the people. In his circumstance, this is what happened. The ten northern tribes had already gone into the Assyrian captivity because of their sin in 720 B.C. Now Judah, who thought of themselves as the righteous Jews, as it were the faithful church, the evangelicals of their day, to make the comparison, now they were going into the captivity of Babylon as well as being under the threat of the Assyrians. They always thought of themselves as the right ones. It's those people up north because of Jeroboam and all that stuff and, and Jezebel and Ahab. They're, 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 they're the bad Jews. We're the good ones. They said. Well, it used to be like that. Oh, born-again Christians and believers, evangelicals, we're, we're, the, we're the good church. It's, 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 it's the liberal Protestants and it's Rome that, you know, the, they're, they're the false church. That's Babylon. 
What happened when Judah went the way of her sister, as Ezekiel put it? <laughs> Same outcome. This is what Isaiah was up against. He was trying to say, look, you guys think to yourself is right? That, that those guys up north were the bad ones? No, 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 no. You do what they did. Under King Manasseh, they began killing the babies sacrificially and worshiped to Moloch. God forgave a lot of their sin. A lot of their sin. Even idolatry. Immorality, widespread social injustice. He was willing to withhold his judgments. Once they began killing kids, they went too far. If he didn't spare the natural branches, I've said this many times, you go to a maternity hospital. What's the main one in Britain? Queen Charlotte in London, I think. You go into the fifth floor. They will be spending in the neonatology ward sometimes several thousand pounds a day to keep one premature baby alive in an incubator. Several thousand pounds a day. Is it worth it? Every penny. 20, 21 weeks gestation, underdeveloped pulmonary system, put them in an incubator. They fight to save their kid's life, spend the fortune on doing it. Rightly so. Get in the elevator, one floor up, they're aborting a baby the same fetal age or even older. No medical reason. Selective. Does it make sense? Does it make any scientific sense? Does it make any clinical sense? It really doesn't make any legal sense. It only makes political sense of a corrupt society. If he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. This is what Isaiah was up against. That's what we're up against. It's getting more and more difficult for Christians to be in the teaching profession the medical professions, the legal profession, the police. It's getting more and more difficult for Christians in those professions. Let's look at what Isaiah was up against. Chapter 1, verse 4, Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, Sons who act corruptly, they've abandoned the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel. They didn't think of themselves that way. But they were very religious. They masqueraded their true spiritual state with religiosity. Verse 13, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your feasts. I hate this stuff. I hate your praise-a-thons. I hate your spring harvest. I hate your green belt. I hate those things. Only stating facts. I was in Australia recently. Two professional musicians from Hillsong, who I first met a few years ago when they left, had been in the band of Darlene Check from Hillsong. And they come to hear me speak when I'm in Sydney. And they told me they left because it was a business. Financial scandals were undercovered on Australia TV. 
people who left the church divulge what was happening financially. But the founder, I'm only stating facts, this is publicly known. A royal commission did an investigation, a royal commission, and published the results of the inquiry. The royal commission. The patriarch of Hillsong, just one example, Frank Houston, was a homosexual pedophile who his son Brian Houston protected knowing what his father was. I knew Pentecostal preachers in New Zealand and Australia, older gentlemen who were friends of mine. They said they knew he was that 35 years ago, but they could not prove it. on TV, on the news. The number two at Hillsong, Pat Masidi. Well, at least he liked girls instead of little boys. Then there was Bobby Houston, her series, Christian Women Love Sex. Have you heard me talk about this? This is not pleasant. If you read the Song of Solomon, which of course is a metaphor of Christ's relationship with the bride demonstrated through Solomon's romance with Shulamit. And it explains marital intimacy by poetic analogy. You know, come into the garden, my sister, my bride, and planting seeds, and oh, this is impregnation and things like this. It is using po poetic metaphor to, to, to describe marital intimacy, and it's pretty direct. I mean, it's, you know, your, your breasts are like fawns and all this stuff. It's, you know, it's erotic. It's erotic literature, but it is not ungodly. And it has a deeper spiritual meaning in the back of it. But the whole thing in the Song of Solomon is, Anila Dodiva Dodili, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. The sexual acts were focused on loving the person, <laughs> not loving the act. The act was simply the means to love the person and to procreate so there could be more love. Now, Eastern religion has a counterfeit version of this in Hinduism called the Kama Sutra, which is just that, a corruption of, of, of the same idea. But the Song of Solomon, it's there. And Jesus uses it, Matthew 23, eschatologically about his return prophetically, as we mentioned briefly in our first session today. Okay. So we're reading it now. This is about Christ and the church and Solomon's romance with Shulamit. But yes, it does describe God's idea of holy matrimony and of romantic intimacy within the parameters of wedlock. No problem. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. The focus is on the person, on the relationship. The act is simply a means. It is not the focus. Your love for the person is the focus. Your love for God is the focus. Your love for a baby is the focus. The act is the means. The act is eros. The baby is storga. The marriage, it's eros, it's filio, it's storga, but it's agape. If God forbid your husband and wife were disfigured in an accident, you'd still love them. It's unconditional. That's the love that never fails. You can't marry somebody on the basis of physical attraction alone, that's gonna fail. It's what God has joined together. So that is the scriptural focus, what God has joined together in the New Testament, the Song of Solomon, I am my beloved's, my beloved is mine, his banner over me is love and all that stuff. That's good. 
Hillsong puts out this series, Bobby Houston, Christian Women Love Sex. I'm telling you, 12, as young as 12, and 13, 14, 15 year old teenage girls in church, in early adolescence, where the attitudes towards romance and sexuality is formative at that age, are being given this, Christian women love sex. Scripture, Christian women love their husbands. Christian women love God. Christian women love babies. It is Hollywood that takes the focus off the person and puts it on the act. It's the world that does that. It's the fashion industry that does that. It's the advertising industry that does that. It is the pop music industry that does that. The world does that. It takes the focus off the person and puts it on the act. Instead of, I love you, it's, I love me. You're just my object for self ingratiation. <laughs> to satiate my own passions. That doesn't work. It's not good enough. Yes, by God's design, it's erotically, erotically pleasurable, but not the way they, they, the focus is not the act. It's the person. This is what Hillsong teaches teenage girls. It's what they teach young people. You've heard me say, when Steve Chalk, the biggest youth minister in the UK, was asked if he would privately perform a same-sex wedding, he said, no, I'm going to do it publicly. He denies penal substitution. This is the church. The church, this is Hillsong. 25, 30 years ago, pastors and youth ministers, you've heard me say this, told Christian parents, quote unquote, talk to your children, get to your children about sex before the world does. 25, 30 years ago, that was the right thing to tell them. 25, 30 years ago, pastors and youth ministers gave the correct message. Get to your children about sex before the world does. Now, Get to your children about sex before the church does. Get to your children about sex before Steve Chalk does. Before Hillsong does. Not the liberal church. Not the Roman church. The so-called evangelical church. That's what Isaiah was up against. That is what we face now. Not pleasant. I'm uncomfortable talking about it. But it has to be said. I just don't like being the one who says it. But let's look. They cover it up with religion, with worship. Of course, it's not worship, it's entertainment, but you've heard me say that already. Verse 19. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. And it's about sin. Let us reason. The abrogation of critical thought. Hebrews 4.12. We are told on the basis of scripture. Kritikos in Greek. Not critical in the sense of fault finding, but examining something objectively on the basis of scripture to see if it's right or wrong, true or false, good or bad. You have a critical spirit. I certainly hope so. Hebrews 4.12 commands every one of us to have a critical spirit. 
If you don't have a critical spirit, there's something wrong with you. Critical thought goes out the window. Just look at it. This is a society. A 40% suicide rate among transgenders. For, you're not supposed to think about that. Most women are opposed to non-therapeutic abortion. You're not supposed to think about that. Islam is a religion of peace. There are three and a half times more conflicts today, this day in history. There are three and a half times more conflicts involving Islam than all of the other religio people groups in the world put together. Burkina Faso yesterday, Nigeria continual. Iraq, Syria, they were even killing each other, the Sunnis and Shias. There's no end to it. They don't kill Christians and Jews, they'll kill each other. Look at the statistical reality. 57 Muslim countries, find me one, one, where Christians and Jews have the same rights they have in Britain, America, or Israel. They can't give you, you're not supposed to think about that. Thou shalt not think. Wait, come let us reason. Thou shalt not think. Isaiah is saying, be reasonable. This stuff is sin, it's wrong. Thou shalt not think. Just follow the party line. Talk to somebody who was in Soviet Union during the Cold War. They had two publications, Pravda and Izvestia, <laughs> it meant truth. Truth was whatever the party decided. Not what was actual, not what was factually the truth. Truth was the official position of the party. <laughs> that was truth. Scriptures are different. Come let us reason together, says the Lord. Paul says, our faith is reasonable. No, it's not an intellectual faith. It's a revelational faith, but it is intellectually defensible. There's empirical evidence. There's, there's reasons to believe the claims of Jesus. It's, it's intellectually defensible. It's logical, it's rational. No, nope. you're supposed to throw critical faculty out the window. People just refuse to think. How could a highly educated, a highly educated G-Y-N-O-B stand next to a neonatologist battling to save the life of a premature baby he delivered the previous day, take a 20 second elevator ride and kill one of the same age for no medical reason? Thou shalt not think. And these are smart people. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Human intellect, not in submission to Christ, will only make somebody more stupid in the long run. No matter how smart they are, human intellect not subjected to the principles of God's word will make somebody more stupid. In the long run. What was next? Let's look at Isaiah. Chapter 1, verse 23. 
Your rulers are rebels, companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe, chases after rewards. They do not defend the orphan or the widow's plea come before them. <laughs> Liberal politicians pretend to care about the poor. This is not political, it's just a factual statement. My grandparents came from Britain. Let me tell you what the welfare state was. After the war, there was this guy, William Beveridge. And they said, we got all these war widows whose husbands were killed fighting the Nazis or the Japanese. And Coventry is destroyed and Liverpool and London are badly damaged. And we have to rebuild the economy and the infrastructure and the industrial base of the country. And we've got all these war widows. So the taxpayer, the state, must step in and assume some of the financial and social responsibility for these kids and help these widows. That's what it was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be about. Then it became a different thing. Instead of a war widow with kids, it becomes a dingbat with five kids born out of wedlock from three different yobos, and we're paying for them. <laughs> That's what a single mother is now. That's not what a single mother was in 1945 or 48. I saw what they did. I remember. The countries that lost the war, like Japan and Germany, they were becoming vibrant economies. In this country, who won the war, supposedly, they were overtaxing everybody, penalizing people for being productive in order to subsidize industries and things that were... <laughs> They, you reward people for being unproductive at the expense of the ones who are productive. Then they wake up one day, Germany's the biggest economy in Western Europe, Japan's the biggest economy in Asia. What happened to Britain? We cared for the widows and orphans. No, you didn't. You replace a husband and a father with a dole check. <laughs> Thieves, they'll play that card, you understand, the people to vote for them. Just look what they're saying. We want a confirmation of the referendum. <laughs> the people voted, but the establishment doesn't like what the people voted. So they're doing what they do in the Republic of Ireland. You keep holding a second and a third referendum until the establishment gets the result they want, then the people have decided. No longer the people's parliament, the parliament versus the people. Make no mistake, there's a spiritual battle on back of this stuff. Daniel chapter two. There is a fight for the future of this country not just economically and politically and socially and culturally, but spiritually. This is Daniel chapter two stuff. We want a confirmation of the referendum. It's the only sensible thing. The only sensible thing is to vote you out of office. The only reason not to vote you out of office is if we can reopen the Tower of London, restore it to its Historical utility. <laughs> Traders Gate. This is what's happening. Your leaders, the leaders act against the interest of the people. They're rebelled, rebels. They're companions of thieves. Chapter two. Verse 2, it'll come about in the last days. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be. Don't worry. Jesus is coming. The government will be upon his shoulders. He will reign from Jerusalem. 
No more stinking politicians. No more corridors of power. The power will be his. No more of this garbage. Human government, democracy can only work if it's based on scriptural principles. The Puritans, for all the mistakes, knew that. The founding fathers of America knew that. But now that they've turned away from the biblical principles, <laughs> that doesn't work anymore. Have another referendum. Have hearings on back of closed doors when you can't face your accuser based on hearsay. <laughs> That's what they do. That's what they do. In the States, there was one judge who Mr. Trump tried to appoint to the Supreme Court who was pro-life. Catholic guy, wasn't a believer. But because he was pro-life, they had to get him. So they went back to high school and they found some woman who said, he tried to molest me at a party when I was 16 and he was 16. He's 56. He's a rapist! Two other people at the party, both of them, her best friends, said it never happened. She said it did. He's a rapist! He hates women! This is what it... This is how sick it's become. This is what government has become. Scum of the scum. No principles, no morals. Nations get the leaders they deserve. Verse six of chapter two. You've abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. It's Israel centric now. Why? Remember these things are written for our instruction because they are filled with influences from the East. <laughs> and they are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. Eastern religion came from Babylon. It was around in the days of Isaiah. When the Persians conquered Babylon, the priests of Babylon, all 300 of them, relocated from Babylon to Pergamum, where Satan's throne is. Jesus spoke of this. It came from the east. In the days of Jesus, it was Philo, the Jewish Gnostic. Then with the post-Nicene church fathers, first it was Oregon, and then there was the post nicene fathers like Basilidus and Valentinus, they were bringing Eastern religion into the church. Alexandria being the interchange of East and West in those days, Buddhist monks and nuns came to <coughs> Alexandria, that time a Greek-speaking city. And so so-called Christians began having convents and monasteries. <coughs> the Buddhist monks, they shaved their heads. So they get the nuns and the monks to shave their heads and go into the monastery. <coughs> During the Crusades, it was the same. The Crusaders, troubadours, were into the spice trade. That's what was really in back of much of the Crusades. The spice trade from India, revolutionizing the economy of Europe. <coughs> which at that time was agricultural. <coughs> the banking families of Italy wanted <coughs> to control it. Well, what happens? They bring back the influences of Hinduism, counting prayer on beads, Vishnu. That becomes the rosary. <laughs> these are all things like, these are influences from the East. Now we have things like the emergent church, 
labyrinths, icons. They have a reconstructed post-Nicene mysticism. You understand? What you see happening with the emergent church and these labyrinths and contemplative prayer, it goes back to that deceiver, Richard Foster, who wrote the book, The Celebration of Discipline. Joyce Huggett, the visualization, these things come from Hinduism. My people are filled with influences from the East. I will never forget when we showed the films of the Toronto laughing drunken nonsense some years ago. The pastors from India who'd been saved out of Hinduism. And they said, this is Kundalini Yoga. They know exactly what it was. My people are filled with influences from the East. That's what's happening now. The same thing Isaiah warned of is what is happening now. If he didn't spare the natural branches, these things are written for our instruction. Verse 8, the land has also been filled with idols. You'll have no other gods before me. I remember George Carey, a man who used to be a Christian. He became the Archbishop of Canterbury to be succeeded by a Druid. And he was in a ceremony on TV with Hindus and Buddhists and God knows who else, consecrating holy sites. And his exact prayer on TV was, what gifts the holy sites give us, according to whichever God you serve. Moses and Paul said other gods are demons. Shadim, the Manoi. That man used to be a Christian. So he says, I met him once in Tel Aviv. We had it out eyeball to eyeball. He didn't like me too much. <laughs> couldn't understand it. I was just asking questions he couldn't answer. Like, uh, how come when they had the first gay and lesbian service at Southern Cathedral about a month earlier, why wasn't he on the protest line in front where Thomas Cranmer would have been? <laughs> How come you kept your mouth shut? <coughs> Land's filled with idols. Chapter 3, verse 5, the people will be oppressed, each one by another, each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm up against the elder and the inferior against the honorable. Now look, Jeremiah, Timothy, they were told, don't let anyone look down on your youth. There are young people who are spiritually and morally upright and doctrinally well established. But when you have youth who don't know anything, coming out speaking rubbish. I watched one clip on the BBC several years ago from an evangelical church where the only thing that was coming out of the mouths of the young people was pure, unscriptural idiocy. Pure idiocy. We've been called, they said, to worship the Holy Spirit. Everything was pneumocentric and the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. They never talked about Jesus. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus. Never himself. He's worshiped in the context of the Trinity. These kids did not know what they were talking about. But this Moronic vicars thought it was wonderful.
J.C. Ryle would not recognize the Church of England. John Wesley would not recognize the Methodists. Charles Spurgeon would not recognize the Baptists. It's getting to the point where Chuck Smith wouldn't recognize some of the Calvary chapels. Well, what else was Isaiah up against? Chapter 3, verse 3, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselor and the expert artesian and the skillful enchanter. I'll make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. There are churches where young people sit around and wait for prophecies. They don't study the scripture. They sit around and wait for prophetic. I have a word, I have a word, I had a picture. This is clairvoyance. This is not prophecy. They get the young people in it, the enchanters. Verse 12. Oh, my people, their oppressors are children. Women rule over them. My people, those who guide you, lead you astray, and confuse the directions of your path. There was one person we got away from. Moriel booted him out. He was from South Africa. We got rid of him. Had to. He taught God the Father was not the creator, that the blood of animals will atone for sin in the millennium, that the gospel is not eternal, and that you can pray into a tie or a jacket, God's power, and knock people over with it. He hid all these things from us and others. We got rid of him. He came to this country and he organized young pastors, young pastors from churches. And he was telling them, that the older generation of people, their day is past, you're the new one, based on all this error. John Angle's church split over this. I mean, it's terrible. Terrible. Now look, if they were teaching the truth, I'd put my feet up and say, good luck, kid. But they weren't teaching, they were being groomed on error. No, no, no. Jeremiah and Timothy were youth who were groomed on truth. I love young people who love the Lord and who are scripturally literate and zealous. I love them. But unfortunately for every one of them, there's five lunatics. Well, what happens next? Then it's the women running wild. <laughs> women will rule over them. Have you ever watched Heidi Baker? Uh, Joyce Meyer? That other nut, the, the, the blonde one, the, oh God. And Cindy Jacobs? It, 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 oh boy. One is worse than the other. They look worldly. And they teach error. Yet people are going to see them. To pay large amounts of money to hear a ridiculous woman who doesn't know what she's talking about pontificate error. Time is coming, and that day the Lord will take away the beauty of their anklets, their headbands, and their crescent ornaments, in verse 16. Their dangling earrings, boy, it must be about Sister Joyce. Bracelets, veils, headdresses, ankle chain, oh God. Instead of sweet perfume, there will be putrefaction. 
In other words, these women stink. That's what's going to happen. That's what is going to happen. That's what happened to Judah in the days of Isaiah. And that's what will happen in the last days. They call good evil and evil good. But then in chapter 5, verse 26, look at it. He will also lift up a standard to a distant nation. He will whistle from it from the ends of the earth, and behold, it will come with speed swiftly. No one in it is weary or stumbles. None slumbers or sleeps. Nor is the belt that is waist undone. Nor is its sandal strap broken. Its arrows are sharp, and all its bows are bent. The hoofs of its horses seem like flint, and its chariot wheels like a whirlwind. Its roaring is like a lioness, and it roars like young lions. It growls and it seizes the prey. <coughs> it carries off, no one to deliver it. And it will growl on that day like the roaring of the sea. <coughs> if one looks to the land, behold, there is darkness and distress. Even the light is darkened by its clouds. In Isaiah's day, that had been Assyria, then Babylon. Today it is Islam. Islam is God's judgment on the backslidden Judeo-Christian world. It's God's judgment on unbelieving Israel. It's God's judgment on Britain. It's God's judgment on America. It's God's judgment on Canada, on Australia, on New Zealand. It's God's judgment on Holland and Germany. It is God's judgment. He will deal with it in his time. But it is his judgment. But what does all this mean for us? What's the good news? How should we react to these realities? You understand this is exactly what happened in Isaiah's day, and it's exactly what's happening now. I'm not giving myself any poetic license. It's quite literal. The correspondence is conspicuous. Chapter 6, verse 12. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet, says the Lord, yet there will be a tenth portion in it. It will again be subject to burning like a tebrinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. The Methodist church is a tree that is cut down and burned. But there's a stump that can grow again. Welcome to the stump. Pentecostalism is a tree that is cut down and burned. But there is a stump, the holy seed, that can grow again. The Baptist Union is a tree that is cut down and burned. But there's a stump, a holy stump, that can grow again. Look, it's gone. It's just religious masquerade. It's over. It's finished. It can't compete against Islam or the cults. Christianity in this country is pretty much a joke. It has been since the laughing and Drunken counterfeit revivals, it's all been a joke since then. That was the turning point. 
It's a joke. It is a complete and utter joke. The children's game Cluedo had a character in the card called Reverend Green or something. They got rid of him because a vicar is no longer a recognizable member of the community in contemporary England. Well, that tells you something. There's no respect for the clergy, nor do they deserve any. That's a, at least justice. Nope. It's gone. British Christianity is gone. American Christianity is going. But there's a stump. Maybe a tenth of what it was. Stump. But that stump is the only thing that matters. That stump is the only thing that can possibly have a future. That stump is the Holy Seed. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Yet, there will be a stump, the holy seed. May the Lord in his grace and mercy make us that stump. God bless you and thank you for listening.